So, good evening, everyone. It's very nice to see you. Uh, for the ones that uh, attended uh, the presentation yesterday, so hello, surprise, surprise, it's me again. And today we'll uh, look at the recap of the course statistics. So, uh, this presentation was made and uh, by me, but it's based on the course of Professor Zivkovic. And uh, it also includes the material from uh, his LMS as well as my own material. Okay, so some basic information for before we start. Uh, so questions are more than welcomed at uh, any time. So you can either raise your hand or just write them in chat. I'll try to, to keep track of chat as well. Um, so sessions will be, this session will be quite long, so approximately two hours. So if you do not uh, have time to watch the whole session today, no worries. Uh, it will, the recording will be posted on YouTube. Uh, that probably also explains very low attendance today uh, in comparison to yesterday's one, uh, as people are probably going to watch the recording tomorrow. But anyway, I'm very happy uh, to see you uh, here today during the live session. Uh, PowerPoint is available on the website. I think Michelle will also post the PowerPoint uh, in chat, otherwise I can do it. Uh, but the session is uh, and the session is made out of two parts. Uh, first part will do general recap of the course. I think yesterday uh, it took us one hour and 15 minutes. So today it will be a bit more. So around one hour and 45 minutes and then around 15 minutes for your questions. We'll see how it goes. Yesterday I think was around 10 minutes. Uh, OK, uh, so uh, no agenda for today, no. OK, so first uh, we start uh, at uh, basics. Um, we introduced the variables at the beginning of semester during the first uh, lecture. Uh, so you, what you have to remember here, because there, I think uh, there are going to be half uh, theory and half calculations for the exam. So uh, it's going to be quite a lot of theoretical questions. So be careful with variables. Uh, but uh, I think it, it's pretty easy when you when you repeat it. So uh, you have in in the base you have two kinds of variables. So categorical variables or qualitative variables. So what do you need to know about these vari vari variables is that they they are not numbers as such. So they can only be counts of the answers, but not really the numbers because the numbers are always numerical variable. Uh, that also explains the name numerical or quantitative. Uh, so for qualitative, for uh, qualitative, we have two kinds: nominal. Uh, for nominal, it's the the, the most uh, simple uh, concept is that they are all of the same value. All the answers hold the same value. No no answer is superior, uh, and you cannot make any any um, any list that's. Uh, for instance, as for the ordinal, where you can make a list and you can sort them according to the uh, to the rating or importance, as for instance the hotel star rating, uh, they are ordered by hierarchy. Uh, yes, Michelle, thank you. Um, so, and on the other hand, we have numerical variable, and we have two kinds. So this one is very easy to remember. We have discrete ones where you cannot have numbers in between. For instance, you cannot have one and a half ch child. So all, all, var all numerical variables that cannot have other values than the whole numbers, they are classified as discrete ones. And the all numbers, all numerical variables that you can have any number, any decimal, any, uh, any, any square root, any um, uh, anything, basically these are continuous variables. Also, uh, note if you have a group data and you have an interval, then you have to be very careful. You have two exercises, uh, and I was uh, specifically uh, warned about these exercises. So don't just say if you look at the variable and you see, uh, I think there is an example in the mock exam, uh, so number of nights spent in a hotel. So everyone would say, yeah, you cannot spend one and a half night in a hotel. That's correct. But if you have an interval, uh, the the variable is uh, automatically becomes continuous. Uh, so be very careful. 
you can only have discrete variable if you have a, a table, so a summary table, and you have uh, the answers. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you have any questions from the mock, you can also ask in the end. Um, so uh, we have um, some kinds of visual representation of the variables that this slide is very important for the exam, uh, as there is a good chance that you, there's going to be at least one question that's going to ask uh, which uh, chart can you use for representation of a certain of a certain variable? So for categorical variable, uh, as I said, these are the variables that you have a summary table for. Usually, these are the 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 vari This is the variable categorical variable. As we say, as we said, we do not have uh, numbers as such for for the answers. So uh, we can either use pie chart. Bar chart, Pareto, uh, side by side chart, or cluster, stacked bar chart, or stacked 100% chart. More on, we will see also the graphical representation of these on the next slide. But I just did one slide without the graphical representation in case you have the question on the exam. You can easily uh, find the slide and uh, you don't have any these pictures to, um, to, to spend too much time on. You just have uh, the basic data. Uh, on the other hand, for numerical data, you can you do bar chart, histogram from stem and leaf, box plot, scatter plot, and line chart. Maybe be very careful about stem and leaf and box plot, but uh, we're coming to that as well. So uh, then we are going to do some descriptive statistic. Uh, OK, so the first thing uh, that we introduced uh, at the beginning of this course was how to organize categorical data. That's, of course, uh, extremely important. If you want to do some analysis, you first have to organize it. So uh, what's the difference? We have two possibilities. First one is a summary table that you can see on the top. So the summary table will only tell us um, the the different connections between between two uh, two factors. And for contingency table, there will be more 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 than two factors. It will be cross tabulation, and we will also have um, you will also have uh, at the end you will have a total. So the factor one of the two factors will also be split into the into the more of them. And for the summary table, on one hand you only have one factor, and on the other uh, you have more. Uh, so that's just a simple difference between summary and contingency table. Um, also, I, I suggest you for uh, the exam, if you know you do to use the um, to use the pivot table, it's usually the simplest and the fastest way to move around the, uh, the data in the Excel. So uh, for the for organizing numerical data, uh, I hope uh, now you, you can uh, distinguish numerical and categorical uh, variables. So this ones, as you can see, these are numbers as such. So these numbers were given as an answer in a survey, probably, or uh, or in a research in this case. Uh, so how to cut, how to do the organize how to organize them? Uh, so you always uh, sort them. First, you, for instance, for this uh, classes representing a value, first you have to uh, remove duplicates, then you have to sort numbers from smaller to larger, and then you use the frequency function. Um, also, uh, be careful of the signs. So, uh, so the X and uh, and the small letter N, uh, and for the for the, the the right table when you have limits. Uh, be also careful about the mid value of the of the limit. So the when you have a group data, mostly you will calculate with mid value, um, with the uh, with value that's the average of the lower limit and the upper limit. Um, but in this case, I hope you know the absolute frequency is given in the number of answers. Relative frequency is given uh, in in the uh, in in the 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 proportion, so the number of answers divided by all answers. So how to do this in Excel? You just take the you just take the 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 F the small letter F for instance F1 here divided by the the number of all answers. But you have to lock the number of all answers and then you just uh, drag it down. Uh, but here also, I think one column that's very important is missing, and that's the cumulative frequency. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, the 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 large the capital letter F uh, is the sign for cumulative frequency, and cumulative frequency is just the sum of all frequencies to the to the point. So, for instance, 72% plus 1940, and at the end, in the last one, you should have 100% if you did it correctly. 
Um, anything else that we did mention so uh, each value can only be in one class yes maybe uh, maybe also mention this uh, that the uh, when you have you sometimes you have the same upper limit of one class and then the lower limit of the next class is exactly the same so what to do in this case in this case uh, you should know that the upper limit uh, is not counted to the group so if, if the upper limit and lower limit are the same, the number will go to the next group. So it will be connected with the next lower limit. But uh, in this table, that's uh, already was already um, done for us. So, uh, OK, so how to do it? So here you once again for the exam, if the question is how you can organize the categorical and numerical data, uh, you have uh, the key points again that you can also uh, look at during the exam. Uh, and this is the this was the purpose of the slide. Uh, and now that the, the the slide I was talking about before. So this is the slide with examples of all visual representation of the data that we can have. As we mentioned, pie, pie chart we can use for categorical variables as uh, as well power chart uh, Pareto um, that's so I hope now you can see why why we can't use for the same variable pie chart and uh, for instance um, um, what let's say histogram uh, of course because for in pie chart it's just an artificial representation of the answers that were counted and sorted so it's just a representation of the frequency and for the histogram it's a represent, representation of the answers that were given in numerical form as such so uh, histogram i think it's one of the most important representations of this course so uh, i hope uh, it's clear for you how to do the histogram how to read the histogram uh, if not uh, please uh, ask at the end uh, and also two important uh, thing, the representations that we did in this course are uh, stem and leaf and box plot. So first of all, uh, let's uh, let's revise uh, what stem and leaf is. So uh, when you have a stem and leaf, usually you won't have a sorted data uh, like here, um, but you will have to know how to use it. So um, here you have also the mid steps. Um, just a second, I'm searching for a pointer, but looks like no. Okay, no worries. Um, yep. No. Okay. So uh, I hope you can see the right re the, the representation. That's not not the left one, not the center one, but the right one. That's the stem and leaf. And on the top of the stem and leaf, you can see one, and then a vertical line, and the two represents twelve. So that's the most important part of any stem and leaf. When you start reading the stem and leaf, when you see a stem and leaf, you always have to look at the the sen the, the sentence that's that's on the top because that's uh, that's that way you how you can orient yourself without this you will be lost because you the, every stem and leaf can have a different meaning so uh, when you see this so this one's very easy so uh, you have one and two so that represents 12 right you were given 20 answers and um, leaf unit is one okay what should we know now is that we have uh, we have data here that on the left side of the stem and leaf, the data is sorted uh, uh, increasing by 10 units and on the right side uh, by one unit. So if we have 10, uh, if we have one zero zero, uh, that represents 100, of course. But be careful in this example because it, the, the legend here is was made for 12 and here you have the numbers that are much larger than 12. Uh, so be very careful. Um, so then I think it shouldn't be too too problematic uh, when reading the stem and leaf. Um, that should be very clear then. Uh, just a second, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to uh, find a pointer. Uh, so we'll maybe we'll just switch. Uh, okay, I'll just switch with the, with the presentation. Uh, I'll just share my screen. Uh, that way I will be able to to show you uh, stuff also on the PowerPoint. Uh, yes, now you can see my pointer. That's much better. OK, yes. So I, I was talking, of course, about this part, right? So you have one and two that represents 12. And here this means 100. 
and you have here the last digit, the most right digit of this uh, is then what makes the total number. So for instance, uh, how to find the median, how to find Q1 and Q3, that's a very important part um, in um, uh, very important part um, from the standard leaf. Uh, okay, sorry. Um, so basically what you have to do when searching for the median is just to count the numbers on the right side. So definition of the median is that half of the numbers are larger than the median and half of the numbers are smaller than the median. So in this case, you have 20 answers, right? So uh, what you have to do if you have an even number of answers, um, you will have to choose a number in between. So in this case, uh, your, uh, your median will be in between the most, so it will be 10 and 10 and a half, right? Because it will be between 10 and 11. So you count the numbers, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, uh, right? Uh, you can also, you could also do it here, for instance, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So this will be the number, but because in this case, uh, your, the, the, the answer 10 and 12 are both 153, so it's not really difficult to find uh, the median here. Uh, the same you do for Q1 and Q3. Maybe the more tricky is box plot, uh, especially because of the, of this ones, uh, of the whiskers. Yeah, whiskers can be tricky. So how to calculate? Uh, so the whisker, uh, you have, first of all, the on, on the box plot, you will have uh, you will have the maximum and the minimum. They are marked by a by a by the so-called whisker, right? That's this one. Perfect. This. Uh, so let me start by introducing the whiskers. So whiskers will give you a range. You will always see the range of answers when you read the box plot from the whiskers. Uh, but uh, as always in the life, we have uh, some exceptions. So uh, we have two, two things that are called fences. In case of box plot, they are calculated as Q1 minus 1.5 IQR and the Q3 plus 1.5 IQR. And if the number exceeds this fences, so if the number is out of the fences, it will be marked as an uh, as an out. Uh, where is what do we have it? Uh, uh, Yes, uh, exactly. So uh, it will be marked as an outlier, as you can see, if it if it's above or below a minimum or maximum value. So in that case, your whiskers will not represent the range. But in all other cases, you know, when you don't have the outliers, your whiskers will give you the will give you the range. Uh, so the box plot is split is split it in quarters. So you have quarter of the answers between the lower whisker and the beginning of the box. You have then 50% of your of your answers in the box that are splitted with the uh, with median. So the line will always be represented. Uh, will always represent medium. Uh, sometimes you will also have a mean or or the average, and usually it's a, it's a cross. Uh, but it will be marked on the legend, of course. Uh, so the, the the borders of the box are quartiles, so Q1 and Q3, uh, and the, of course there is a maximum here on a whisker. Um, so this is a IQR interquartile range is the, the the size of the box, the length of the box. So we have some uh, for uh, the cut for uh, theoretical questions in the exam. It's important to know some theory uh, about characteristics of the distribution. Uh, so first we have symmetry, uh, symmetry of the distribution. Uh, we have symmetrical histograms or uh, or not symmetrical. Of course, everyone knows how a non symmetrical histogram looks like. But in this case, just be careful if you have some symmetrical histograms. Uh, you will have some specific uh, characteristics that will only only co hold in case of symmetrical histogram. So if the data is symmetric, uh, so that will mean that you have the the shape. Uh, if of if it's mirrored here, you could set a mirror and the data would be the same, right? That's how you know that it's symmetrical. Um, the mean and the medium are close together. If it's exactly symmetrical, then the mean and the medium are the same numbers, of course. 
Um, so we have then a peak of the distribution. We have unimodal and bimodal histogram. So for bimodal histogram, uh, you don't. It's not. Uh, you don't need to have two modes or two modal classes uh, in this way. Here you have two modal classes, but here you don't. Bimodal distribution just means that you have two peaks. Uh, you see that you have actually one mode here. Uh, just if you imagine, you split. If you split the data in two parts, you would have uh, two modes. So that's why it's called bimodal histogram. And this one is unimodal because you, you only have one, you have, a, you have a shape of normal distribution. And here for bimodal, you'd have, you don't have a shape of normal distribution. And then you have a shape of distribution, speaking of a shape, you have skewness, Skewness is an important term that you have to know. So you have positive and negative skewness. Maybe it's it's better known as a right or left skewness. Um, so uh, doesn't matter how you're asked. Now you just have to remember. So if the average is higher than the median, then it, the data are pos is positively skewed. Uh, and if the average is lower than the median, then the data is negatively skewed. And then we have some descriptive statistics. OK, so you have three location indicators and three variability indicators, uh, four in this case. But uh, it's because we also have coefficient on variance, which is not really, which is not a variability indicator. Uh, it's just here because it's also one uh, indicator that we have to know for the exam. And also two relationship indicators, covariance and correlation. Uh, first of all, for ungrouped data, we'll now split the presentation. We'll first look at ungrouped data and later we'll look uh, for group data. So for ungrouped data, what we calculate, we can calculate mode. So for mode, we use frequency. So the 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 ups, the, the the class or uh, or the the answer or the variable with the most with the higher absolute and relative frequency. Uh, is the mode. So the mode is, is, is just simply most common answer, the answer with most with the highest frequency. Median, we have to sort the data. If you have, uh, if you have ungrouped data, you have to sort it. Uh, you, then you calculate the median. Uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, just as I said, half of the answer are smaller, half of the answers are larger than the medians. And then you have an average, which can also be called mean. So mean and the average is the same thing. And then you have variability indicators. First of all, there's the range. It's the, the range is calculated as the maximum minus minimum. IQR, it's Q3 minus Q1. Variance in the standard deviation, we'll look at this too later in, during this recap. Uh, so how can you calculate the mode? Uh, usually using the Excel function mode mult. If you are using the newest version of Excel, uh, I think uh, the last uh, three years, Excel can all, you don't need to use the control shift enter anymore. And the Excel, if there are two modes, Excel will automatically give you the two modes. But uh, otherwise, if you have the older version of the Excel, you have to drag this formula down to check if there, are, if there is more than one mode. Median, it's the simple function medium, and then the data range, same for the average, it shouldn't be uh, problem, any problem. So uh, medium by, by ranking is a short exercise. Um, so just to show that the medium, median is not the same as, uh, as the, um, um, as the as the average. So in this case, uh, how you can, if you don't have a lot of data, you can just calculate uh, the median using the using the elimination method. So you cross one answer on each side, and whatever is uh, uh, is left. Of course, first you have to uh, you have to sort them. These are not sorted. I've just uh, noticed. So we have one, two, three, four, four. Uh, four, seven, eight, uh, and nine, I think. Uh, so as I, as I showed you, right? So you three answers here, three answers here, and then uh, whatever is left in the middle, uh, it's, the, it's the median. Uh, and for the average, you don't calculate it like this. You calculate it as a sum of the answers. So two plus eight plus all between and plus nine divided by 
the count of this one. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So divided by nine. And that's the difference between mean and the median. As I said, this will tell you the skewness, right? We we saw this uh, here. So uh, about the skewness, if the skewness is positive, uh, the mean uh, mean uh, in this case uh, will be lower than the average, and here it will be the opposite. Okay. Okay. Um, let's, yes, this slide, um, perfect. Um, so for this one, we just, we, you just have the data. Uh, I, I repeated uh, all the calculations that are done in Excel. Uh, so for range, as I said, it's just a difference between min maximum and minimum IQR. So the formula for, for quartile, it's quartile.ec. Uh, e X C E, and then you have to do data range. You have to input data range and the quartile that you are searching for. Uh, so quartile two is also median uh, variance. Uh, so when you're calculating variance and standard deviation, you also have to be careful if there if this is uh, the data is sample or population. Uh, but uh, in most of the cases, it will be a sample. You almost never have a population. Um, coefficient of variance. Uh, this is just standard deviation divided by the average. So standard deviation explained how, what's the standard deviation. It's especially important for our group data because in group data, it's not so intuitive. So first of all, you have to calculate uh, the, when you calculate the standard deviation, first of all, we need to calculate the, we need to calculate the, the average or mean. So first, uh, first part will be to calculate the average. Uh, and when we calculate the average, the next step uh, here, we just have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight answers. So in this case, it's easy to represent. So this, this line, so we mark the average. The average in this case is 1.75. And then you will look at each answer and see uh, and minus. So you will do average um, minus the minus the indicator, right? So in this case, for instance, we'll get minus 0 0.2 uh, and that then you continue. But because some numbers, for instance, this one will have a minus sign. That's why you will have to uh, and that's why we have to square this one to eliminate the minus sign. That's why we have to square this. Uh, and then we'll just do the sum of this I will just mark its uh, average like this. You just do the sum and that's the variance, right? This is the vari variance. And uh, the, the standard deviation, standard deviation is, is just the square root of variance. So uh, sometimes it will be S can be standard deviation or it can also be for a group, uh, for group data for samples can also be marked like this. And whenever you have it this squared, that's the variance. OK, variance doesn't have a special sign. It's just the standard deviation squared. Uh, you also have uh, this uh, here. If you want to, to look at this later uh, with your pace, everything's on the slides. Uh, so no, uh, so no worries about uh, if you didn't catch everything. Now, um, so next part of the presentation will focus on group data. First of all, uh, we will we show how to calculate model class. It's calculated not by frequency. Be be careful. Be very careful. It's calculated by density, not by frequency. That's a very common mistake. Uh, median. We calculate median and Q1 and Q3 using linear interpolation. Uh, I'll show you how to do this in Excel, and then we also calculate mean. So how do we calculate the mean or average? We need to have a, a central in the middle of the class, the midpoint, as we call it, um, and then we we sum product the the uh, the midpoint and the frequency uh, and the absolute frequency, and you divide this by the number of of answers. 
variability will calculate range iqr also as i said using linear interpolation variance and standard deviation um so for model class uh, this is a class with highest density uh i will show you later about this median you have to do the you have to use a forecast linear or just a forecast function but i will also show this later uh, and the average as i said it's just a sum product x i c that's the that's the the mid the class midpoint okay so uh to highlight this this x i c that's the midpoint that i was talking about i hope you all know what i mean if you don't know what i mean please uh ask at the end or just go uh to the to the solution of the excel file for for uh, chapter one uh and check what is uh midpoint or xic because you need midpoint in this case to calculate the average standard deviation um to calculate basically most of the things for group data okay so the model class first of all um that's the thing that i said you have to be very careful on the exam uh first you have to calculate the class range if you want to calculate model class because in this case it's going to be 10 10 as well uh, but in this case, it's going to be 20, right? And in this case, 10 as well. So if we just looked at this data, uh, we have our absolute frequency here. Um, we just say, yes, uh, we have two, we have two classes, two model classes, right? Because we have 10 answers here and 10 answers here. So we would just say, so uh, model classes, So we'll just say, OK, there are two model classes, but that's not the truth because uh, you need to divide this. You need to divide this by free by uh, uh, you need to divide the frequency. OK, so the frequency you divide by class range. So in this case, we get zero because it's zero. In this case, we get 0 0.05. But in this case, we get 0 0.002 uh zero two not zero zero but zero point zero two five right and zero and now we can see oh crap we can't we don't have two model classes we have just one model class that's the class with highest density and not the, the one here although they have the same absolute frequency uh because this class is size this 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 class is a uh, is actually twice uh twice as size of this one so you have to take this into consideration when calculating model class uh i hope this was a very um now this presentation after this presentation you will remember this um linear interpolation or uh, you could do it by hand we really don't uh, the, the professor showed in class how to do it by hand uh, i'm not going to do it here i'm just going to give you the formula this is the formula that's on excel but uh, as i know it's probably uh, very stupid to have x known y is known axis i adopted this formula so um this is the formula that uh, I, I wrote for you. It's simplified one. So it's wanted value, wanted value. Usually you will either search for 1.25, right, for Q1. You will either search for 0 0.5, that's the median, or for 0 0.75. Uh, don't, you won't be needing any other numbers so it's one of those three and then you have the upper limits uh, of the classes you have to look at the classes upper limits of the classes uh, of the two classes where the, the number you are searching for lies uh, lies uh, in in between right so um, you have to look at the cumulative frequency no other way so if this is a cumulative frequency uh, and you are searching for a median so if you have 45% here and you have 51% here, that's the right one. That's the one that you're looking for. And so your formula in this case will be nothing else than if you are searching for a median in this class, your formula will be nothing else than a forecast linear 0 0.5 the upper limit, so these two values and the cumulative frequency, so this one. And that's uh, all you need to know about the linear interpolation. 
And then the next one, calculating statistical indicators. Perfect. Uh, I For group data, I highlighted two standard deviation and variance. It can be quite tricky. If you are not sure how to do it, uh, I have two suggestions. First one is ask at the end of the session. Second one, if you are watching the recording of this session, uh, it's YouTube. Uh, be sure that you know how to calculate it because 99% uh, you're going to need it on the exam. So the range is just uh, calculated as uh, as the difference of the middle points of the higher and the lower class. So be careful. Not the the range is not calculated as the as the lower uh, as the lower lower limit and the highest upper limit. No, you have to calculate the middle points for the range. So it's middle points. Be careful. Interquartile range, you have to use linear interpolation to calculate it. Uh, and then variance and standard deviation is where I want to spend some more time on um, because it can be quite tricky. Uh, I'm not sure if I have this on the slides. Uh, if not, I can show at the end in the Excel uh, practically how to calculate variance and standard deviation in Excel. Uh, so let's do this at the at the end. Um, and then coefficient of variation, nothing too difficult. Uh, please just uh, mind the formula uh, because uh, some people tend to forget this formula. We didn't use it too much, so uh, write it down or just remember that you have some uh, ratio that's called coefficient of variation uh, and you should be good to go. Um, two things, uh, covariance and correlation, uh, pretty similar but with one big difference right so they will tell you the 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 correlation of they will tell you the relationship of the data so but they tell you two different things the covariance will only tell you if the relationship is positive or negative you don't look at the value okay for covariance the number is not important or if it's if it's 0 0.5 or 700 it doesn't matter it's only positive or negative. It's just the sign that's important for covariance. Uh, the number tells you nothing. So if you want to see the strength of relationship, you have to look at the correlation. And in correlation, it's the opposite. So the sign doesn't tell you anything. Nope, you have to look at the number. So here it is important, right? Two equals 100 here. And here, 700 is more than one. So the relationship in this case is is uh, is uh, more is uh, stronger than in this case. But here, this doesn't tell you anything about the, the strength of the relationship. How to calculate it? You have two uh, amazing formulas uh, that I just, uh, just I just crossed. Don't know why. Um, so the first formula is uh, so-called covariance sample. Just use sample always. Uh, uh, you don't have two options here, so that's why we always use co covariance S. And for correlation, you use Corel. Uh, it's nothing special about this formula. It's always input is just data range. Uh, and uh, I don't think you have to know uh, how the definition of this. Um, okay, just a little exercise. So uh, on, on a graph, what means, what is the, how is the positive relationship represented? So as you can see, uh, all the points that are here, so for instance, these points, they, they have negative deviation from X, right? So they are on negative side of X and they are on negative deviation of Y as well, because they are on the left side of X axis and they are below the Y axis. So because minus minus, the overall effect is positive. And the, for the points here, they have two positive effects. So any, uh, any line that goes through to, to these two parts of the coordinate system through the num to, to the first one and the third one, uh, this is the positive relationship. But is there a difference on the graph? Can you spot the difference between the strength of the relationship? Yes, you can. So this relationship is stronger than this one. And this is a negative relationship, as you can see. Right? I hope this is clear. If not, uh, just ask right in chat and just let me know. Um, so 
Okay, uh, laser. Yes. So probabil probability. Uh, it's our uh, second uh, large chapter of this semester, uh, but that shouldn't be too problematic. Uh, it's quite intuitive, uh, and most of you have probably done it in high school. So uh, probability is a numerical measure of likelihood that an event will occur. Uh, so an event. As always, a possible event always have uh, has two two possible or more possible uh, outcomes, right? So uh, each possible outcome uh, of a var variable is referred to as event, right? So each possible outcome is an event in this case. Um, probability of each uh, outcome is non-negative, so every probability has to be either zero or larger than zero, but the sum of all probabilities must be equal to one. Uh, so uh, when you calculate the probability, always make sure that your answers match are matching this, uh, because if you find out in the exam uh, that the probability of uh, of one event on your on your LMS answer sheet is uh, one point five or or one hundred fifty percent. Yeah, then you you should think about uh, doing the exercise for exercise for the second time uh, because this doesn't really uh, look uh, as uh, as a correct answers in probability. Um, so I, I hope you will now remember this. Uh, so always make sure uh, each each event is either zero or uh, a bar or a number between zero and one, and the sum of all probabilities must be equal to one. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, so it's just three methods. Uh, first one is classical or mathematical, so uh, how to calculate the, the probability of the event, empirical or relative, and the subjective. But that's not uh, extremely important for this course, just for you to know that. And then we have some basic relationships. We have joint events, right? So event that has two or more characteristics, that's important. You have complement. Complements are two events that are complementary if they are disjoint uh, and they complete each other. Um, sorry. Uh, so event E includes all events that are not part of event uh, event E. So uh, complement events they are they complete each other, right? So be very careful about this. Uh, mutually exclusive events they cannot occur at the same point. When one occurs, the other cannot. So this is the opposite of the complement and the sample space. is just the collection of all the possible outcomes. Um, just for, for the three most important notations for you. Uh, so you have a union. Union is just, uh, as you say, you can say a plus. So it's one plus the other. So uh, so you will have the, the entire field, that's why it's the union, so it's everything. Uh, intersection, it's just what's in between, so it's this part that lie, that's uh, the, um, the, 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 the group that applies for both, uh, for both A and B, and then you have the property, that's uh, A plus B minus the, the ones in between, so that's this ones plus this ones, without the green ones, that's the property. Uh, okay, you can also see this here. Um, maybe this one mutually exclusive disjoint event. As we said, they are they have nothing. If one occurs, the other cannot. So that's why uh, this notation as well. Um, and uh, maybe the union and uh, the difference here between property and the union. So if this was a property uh, uh, instead of union, we would have to to minus this one, right? as you can see here as well for the union. So uh, we always minus the, the answers that are the, the intersection, right? This is the minus the intersection. Um, marginal probability. So first of all, marginal probability. Uh, this is just the sum of all probability with common characteristics. Always, once again, sum of marginal probabilities has to be one, so 100%. So we have two, two examples of marginal probability here. Uh, the first one being the, the, the hotel name. So 
in this one and the other one being the uh, the row labels or the uh, the, the, it, the 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 data uh, the variable of return to the hotel or not. So marginal probability is the most uh, it's the first split when we first split the data to two factors. Uh, then we have joint probabilities. Uh, so some of joint probabilities once again equals to 100 and these are probability with two common characters so these are the probabilities inside the box right all this well, all these probabilities are joint probabilities uh, so for instance uh, a1 joined b1 as this one so this is the joint probability of a1 and b1 as or as we called it before the intersection between A1 and B1. We have also conditional probability. This one's a bit more tricky. Uh, so, for instance, 60% of all customers love chocolate ice cream or 26% um, of all customers would not return to the hotels. But 15% of those like love strawberry ice cream. And, for instance, 4.71% uh, of those won't return to Palm Royale. So how do you calculate what's the formula then? For instance, so it's the formula, it's the, the intersection between A and B divided by, the, by the, the first one, or as we say here, the second one, because that's probability B of A. So in this case, if we have an example, what's the probability of customer not returning, uh, not returning to the Paul Royal Hotel? So it it will be, uh, yes, it will be P. Okay, yes. So what will be? So because the the A one is then the, the the answer that we are going to divide with so the a1 will be here because a1 represents all the customers that won't return to the hotels right and the b1 represents the palm royal customers so among among all customers of the Paul, the customers that won't return how many customers is the palm royal customers that won't return sorry okay b and of course, um, so it's 4.71, as we said, so it's the intersection divided by the second one. So divided by 26.71. And that's the probability of customers, or that's the conditional probability of customer not returning to Palm Royale. We have a probability tree. Uh, first, we have marginal probability uh conditional probability and the joint probability um independent events uh what is the definition of the independent event so uh in case of independent event you will have to calculate uh first the intersection and then just the the multiply the the likelihood of one event by the other so in this case uh, you can see uh, here this one is uh, D50, uh, it's B56, D54, I use the colors to highlight this. So uh, what's the probability of if the Starbucks is defined as A and prefer Starbucks as B, so uh, see the brand as A, sorry. How many customers that see the brand prefer Starbucks? So uh, the other question is, is Starbucks really better than the, the normal coffee? So is it worth the money? So uh, of the customers who saw the brand, 20%, so 40% um, of customers saw the brand Starbucks, and uh, of course, 23% of all customers preferred Starbucks. So uh, the intersection will be 20%, it's given. Um, but the... Uh, but you will to see if the events are independent. You will also have to calculate, just multiply all the customers preferring Starbucks to all the customers uh, who saw the brand, and you will get that only 12% uh, would, if this event, if this event was independent, only 12% would prefer Starbucks from the ones that saw the brand. Um, so we can see as these numbers are not the same. 
we can say that this is not the independent event. So this one is not an independent event. Uh, and we already are in discrete random variable. So uh, the probability distribution for random variables describes how probabilities are distributed over the values of random variable. So we describe how probabilities are distributed. Uh, the probability distribution is defined by a probability function denoted by f of x that provides the probability for each value of the random variable. The required conditions for a discrete probability function are, of course, one, once again, that uh, all f's are either equal or larger to of zero and the sum of all probabilities is once again equal to one. So first of all, here we have a uniform probability distribution. Why uniform? Because the distribution is the same for each outcome. So this uh, particular example is rolling a dice. So six, we have six possible answers, six possible outcomes. So we will have uh, here just a simple table of uniform probability because each outcome has the same probability. But if we roll the dice twice, uh, we'll see we don't have a uniform probability again. We have a, a normal distribution uh, here. Um, so you have a table of outcomes and you can see that the outcome that's in the center is the most likely to, to occur um, because you just roll the dice twice and you have more combinations you can see here. So for if you want to get seven, you have one, two, three, four, five, six combinations to get seven. To get one or six, they're just one combination. So, uh, yes, uh, this is uh, intended to represent uh, the random the random variable distribution. So uh, let me ask you a question to see if you are still with me or you already uh, left. Uh, so if you have on, a, on or in this case, uh, this is a casino game. I think you should all mostly, most of you know, know this game. So if, if you have the last five numbers, so, uh, so just shortly for me to explain, um, here you have two possibilities. Uh, either the, the number is black or red or the green, the zero, but disregard the green. Uh, let's say that you always bet on color that's either black or red. So if the last five colors were red, so what is the possibility? Is the possibility then uh, same or different to get to get the red in in uh, uh, to get red in the next try? Uh, so here, what's the possibility of getting the red? But please, we disregard this zero, right? Let's forget. Let's say that there are half red and half black. So you had one, two, three, four, five. Past five outcomes were red. So what is the what is the probability of getting the red again? Uh, so the probability is nothing else than one half or zero point five. So this this example is just a representation representation for you that that past events they do not change the probability of the future events. So if you have, uh, for instance, um, two girls already in a family, and uh, uh, the wife or three girls and the wife is pregnant for fourth time, uh, the probability for getting either a boy or a girl doesn't change. It's still 0 0.5. But then we can ask ourselves, what is the, uh, the probability then of getting two, uh, two girls in a row? So if they, if they're, if, what if we ask is, the, but of course you have to know it's the different question. If we ask, what is the probability of getting two girls uh, among, uh, for instance, if it's not in a, in a, in a particular uh, sorting, but if you say in a row, then you have to multiply it, of course. Um, but if you just uh, just take a look at the future event, you just have to remember that it's not affected by the past results. Never. 
Okay, and then that leads us to expected value. Uh, expected value, which is nothing else than some some product of uh, two, two columns that will give you the expected value. Uh, it's the future value and uh, it's a sum of all products of future value and the probabilities of particular values. Um, so notations in this case will be a bit different, as I said, for the sample at the population. So for the average, this will be the sign for the for uh, for the for the average for the population. We have some different signs, but as I said, when you see it squared, that's always a sign that you are dealing with variance. Variance and standard uh, deviation in this case, uh, maybe just uh, of the, the the calculating uh, expected variance in this case is a bit different. So you have to take uh the this the 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 x i's so the probabilities and you have to minus the average and then square it and in the other and then in the other part of the equation you will have your uh your um your values right so um that's uh, how you will uh, calculate the um the variance and to get the standard deviation it's just the square root of the variance uh, so, as in this case, so uh, I represented here. So, for the expected value, we just used, whoop, whoop, we just used the um, the sum product of both of both columns. And for the variance, it's a bit more tricky because we first use the seven, the eighty-seven, as I said. So, uh, we first use the outcomes. And we minus the expected value. Okay, minus the expected value. Let me use the orange one here. And then we square it. Okay, and then we multiply it by the probabilities. So expected value minus e squared times probabilities in some product. And the standard deviation is just the square root of the variance. And then for continuous random variable, we have different representation because you, our representation will not be uh, will not be the will not be points as in discrete, but it will be an equation and a, or a graph. Uh, mostly we will use we will deal with normal distribution. Um, sometimes there will be a formula as for here. Um, why is there a 20 here? I hope you, you remember because for each value we have 20 values here in between. So it's one divided by 20 for each space on the graph. Normal distribution is just a probability function that describes how values of variable are distributed. It's symmetric um, and most more, most observations are clustered around the center. So if we are just speaking about normal distribution, uh, then it's also a matter of standard deviation. So if we have a small standard deviation, our normal distribution will be very high and narrow. If we have a large standard deviation, it will be, uh, it will not be as high and it will be wider. Uh, but because we like to standardize, we uh, also use a standard normal distribution, how to use it. So for each point that we want to transform to standard normal distribution, uh, we take the point, we minus the average and divide it by the standard deviation to get the position on this scale. So on the upper scale, this is just for standard normal distribution. So when you when you are calculating for standard normal distribution, you do not need the standard deviation because it's standard, as I said. Uh, what you have to remember, however, here uh, is this one, especially so a distribution between uh, between the standard deviation. So you have average here and between average and the first standard deviation uh, you have uh, on each side, you have 68.2% of data, okay? And between minus three and three, you have 95.4% of the data. That, uh, that's important for standard normal distribution. 
uh, using Excel, uh, you use uh, some, you use a few different functions. So because the Excel can only calculate the field uh, of the graph from the point to the left side, uh, you have to be, uh, you have to use some tricks to calculate. Uh, if you need to calculate the the the, the size of the or the probability uh, that's on the left side, then you're good to go with with formula just as it is. So it's norm this. It's the point that you are looking, uh, the point that you are looking for. Um, yeah, it's the point that you're looking for, and then um, it's uh, just let me show you. Yeah, it's the 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 average, the standard deviation, and always one at the end. Okay, so at the end there will always be one. Um, I just um, sorry, just lost the uh... okay. So if you have to do to calculate the point in between the, the, the probability of uh, in between two points, then you will have to minus the, the point on the right to the point on the left. And if you have to just calculate uh, the probability on the right side, then you just have to 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 have one minus the the probability on the left. Um, so uh, for as for an Excel, you can all, all, all always also calculate the points on the on the x axis, but you have to use the formula called norm inf. So inverted. So this will give you you will uh, you will input the size of a field like here, and that will return the the x value. Uh, yes. So for for the Excel formulas, as I said, so you have norm dist and norm env. So norm dist when you are searching for for a size of or probability, and norm env when you are searching for for a point x on the on the x axis and when you have a standard distribution you don't need to put other factor factors in the formula you just use the letter s in between uh, there's nothing else that's prepared i think i mentioned i, I think i said before that i will uh, show something in excel yes exactly so what did the, the teacher also warned us about uh, about the calculating variance uh, variance for the for grouped uh, data, I think. So I'll just shortly uh, shortly show you once again as a reminder because the the professor said that a lot of times uh, they have mistakes for mistake from students about the about calculating variance and standard deviation in the group data. So let me just share uh, just a second. I'll share a screen with you just to, to, to repeat. Uh, yes, so this is the then the the the, uh, the Excel sheet. And as I said before, during the presentation, uh, because I didn't have the picture on the PowerPoint, I promised you that I will show you later. So this is how you calculate uh, the step. This is are the steps. So first of all, as I said, you have an upper and you have a lower limit, right? You have to search for the upper and lower limit and you have to calculate the middle point. How do you calculate the middle point? It's just the average of the upper and the lower limit. This is very important. That's crucial for your for calculating variance and standard deviation, as well as the absolute frequency. You will also need the absolute frequency when calculating the standard deviation and variance. These are the two factors that you need. Of course, also what you need to calculate first uh, is the average. As you can see in this formula, you will also need the average. So how do you calculate the average? You have to calc you have to calculate it using some products of mid classes and uh, and uh, absolute frequency as I said to calculate the total 
So in this case, it's total total of prices. It could be total number of nights. It could be anything. And then you have to to only take the sum of all of all answers or so variables. And to get the average, you divide all values by the number of values, so by n. And as as uh, as by calculating variance and standard deviation for ungrouped data, it's nothing else. You only difference is that you will take the class, the middle class, instead of because you don't have an ungrouped data, right? You can't take an interval, so that's why you will take the mid class. You will take mid class minus the average. Uh, and you will square it. Why do you square it? You square it because you want to avoid the minus sign. You don't want a negative number because you are calculating the size of the area. So this, the, you are calculating uh, this, the, the size and the size cannot be negative. And the next, the last step that you have to make is to calculate this number and multiply it by the absolute frequency. And then you're good to go. To get the variance, you will then just sum all of these, and we can check um, what you have to do then just to get the variance. Okay, so they did it here uh, directly in formula. I suggest you to first calculate the sum of of your uh, of your values here, uh, but you can also do it like this. So you sum this once and you divide them by n minus one why n minus one because of course we are speaking about the sample again and anytime always when we are speaking about the sample then always we have to calculate it with n minus one if we were speaking about population you divide it by n and not by n minus one and um that is what i planned uh, for uh, for today uh, it's now time if you have any uh, general questions about the presentation, about the course, about the LMS content, about anything, uh, I'll wait a couple of minutes. Thank you so much, it was great. Thank you. So I see someone, how do you find the average? Okay, yeah, we have very good question. Thank you. Uh, of course, you have you can calculate the average on Stan and Liv, uh, as it, there is also, uh, I think two examples are on the LMS. Um, so hopefully you will be given the sum of the answers. So hopefully you will be given the sum, right? Otherwise, you have to sum all the values, right, in this case. Um, so you have to do uh, 100 plus 105 plus 109 plus 122. So you need the sum of all values and you divide it by N here. You see the N is 20. But uh, I guarantee you, if you will be asked for an average, they will give you, uh, they will give you the, um, you will be given the sum of the, all the values. So you will just need to divide sum of all values by by n. So by all, all, all of, uh, the number of answers given. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. I see another one coming in. Uh, yes, perfect. Okay, uh, yes, I think there are no other questions for today. Uh, still, if you have any questions, just feel free to contact me by uh, email, uh, by Instagram. Uh, I'll be more than happy to answer your questions tomorrow. Uh, also for the people who will be watching the recording tomorrow, uh, if you still have any questions, feel free to contact me or to contact EHR Recap. And I also would like to invite you uh, to watch the recap sessions on Monday. It will be macroeconomics recap session uh, with Timo. And on Tuesday uh, will be um, hospitality economics recap session with Cecilia and myself. Uh, 
that will be then uh, all for today, all for tonight. Uh, we we were quick. We we're only uh, quicker than I predicted. Uh, and then I will just wish you a very, very pleasant rest of the evening. Uh, thank you and uh, good luck.